Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining on this fine Wednesday morning on March 25th, uh, and uh, invite you to this uh, uh, webcast from Italy on COVID-19 cat lab implications, a frontline view from Italy to be presented by Professor Giuseppe Tarantini, who is the Professor and Director of Interventional Cardiology at the University of Padua in Italy, uh, and is also the President of the, of the Society <laughs> of Interventional Cardiology in Italy. So I think that, uh, I want to also introduce my co-moderators along with me from Cardiovascular Innovations, Dr. Mehdi Shishibur, uh, Dr. Manas Brilakis, and I think uh, Paul Saraja, Dr. Paul Saraja is gonna join in uh, shortly. And uh, we also have our manager doc, uh, is, uh, is uh, Kelly Desatnik, who is also going to monitor the chat lines. Just because this is a, such a large webcast with a lot of attendees, we will let uh, Dr. Tarantini to uh, present his slides and he has made some very useful videos and, uh, and we are going to hear him. We will be able to ask him some moderated questions that we will monitor through the chat line during the presentation. So Giuseppe, I hope that is okay with you. We will not make many interruptions because this is a large forum. And after his presentation is over, we will try on the four of us, we'll try to summarize all the chat questions that we are monitoring actively and ask Professor Tarantini to answer those. We will also have a direct audience Q&A if possible, but I hope you, are, you all understand that that might be technically slightly more challenging. So please be patient and please text us your, uh, your uh, uh, chat questions. I am also, we are also aware that all attend, possible potential attendees are unable to join the meeting. We are going for them. We are, we are sending out messages right now and uh, we have extended our capacity today, but we will immediately after this webcast is over, we will post the entire content of this webcast along with the Q&A recorded live uh, on our website at www.cvinnovations.org and uh, Kelly has already sent out that message. Without, uh, uh, without further ado, I invite Professor Tarantini for taking this very precious time from his busy clinical service and also from his personal life to share the insights of what they have learned in Italy uh, tackling this menace of COVID-19 and how and where to go from here. So Professor Tarantini, the floor is yours. I, I urge all attendees to mute their lines. And again, as I said, uh, myself, Manas and Mary will be monitoring the chat lines very actively and ask those questions from Dr. Tarantini during the presentation and afterwards on your behalf. Thank you very much, Professor Rantini, Giuseppe, my dear friend, the floor is yours and I, uh, and I urge you to begin your presentation. Thank you, Sabash. Thank you to all uh, you know, the organization, organizers of this very interesting webinar. I would like to thank you for having me. I think this is an opportunity to share knowledge about what we have learned in the middle of this sanitary disaster. So let's move on to my first slide. My first slide is important because it's, you know, my agenda. Please attend this webinar if you wish to know more about the portrait, and the unique aspects of the new virus, definition of suspected confirmed COVID patient and asymptomatic patients, standards and control measures to adopt to prevent introduction and spread of the COVID-19 and cat lab, the step-by-step -step practical approach in case of suspected or confirmed COVID patient. And we're gonna, you know, analyze all the different phase that are real world phase. That means before the lab, periprocedural management, staff environment, donning and doffing and post-procedural requirements. So having said that, I think it's important to start with this statement. What I'm going to present is where we are now in Italy, is the arrival point. We didn't start from here, and this is probably, you know, the, the key points, the key takeaways of all my presentation, just to understand where we, where we arrive after, you know, this, the explosion of the outbreak. So my first slide is just to discuss the portraits of the virus to say that the SARS-CoV-2 is very similar to the SARS-CoV-1. But there is a but that is the following. The SARS-CoV-2 has a higher rate of transmission. So we need to understand why. And you know, one thing might be the stability on the surface of the virus. But actually, if you look at the paper, the recent paper on New England Journal of Medicine, you can 
clearly see that there is no difference in stability between the two viruses. Because in the aerosol, the virus lives for three hours on cardboard for one day and on plastic and stainless steel surfaces up to through two or three days. So it is important to keep in mind when you think of the contact. So if it is not related to stability, how we can explain the higher rate of transmission? So there are two at least epidemiological features that are very typical of the SARS-CoV-2. The first one is the high viral loads compared to the COV-1, and this is very important. The second point is the potential to transmit the virus while the patient is asymptomatic. So moving ahead to the concept of what is the asymptomatic carriers, what is about these kind of, you know, patients, this is important to know because make it tough to target this, this, this patient. We have two studies. The first one is Japanese. The second one is a Dutch studies that shows in the first case that the whole passengers of the Diamond Princess cruise ship 18% of these passengers were asymptomatic COVID patients. In the Dutch study, the proportion of pre-symptomatic transmission was at least 50% up to 60% according to, to the site, Singapore or Tianjin respectively. But what is most importantly is the following, that even though the community is the main source of infection, the healthcare setting are all are vulnerable too because you know we have a stability of the virus in aerosols and on surfaces and so what we know by the WHA is that in Wuhan 41 of the COVID transmission were clearly hospital related and in Italy this is most importantly more than 10 percent of the hospital COVID uh, workers are COVID positive and this is, you know, a huge number. I think if you think to the whole, you know, population infected by the COVID positive, by the COVID virus. So what about the definitions? The definitions are clearly important because we need to, you know, to tackle the clinical situation according to what is suspected, probable, or confirmed. And as you can see in the website of the World Health Organization, there is a continuous changing of the definition based on the changing of the changing of the epidemiological factors. So it is recommended to consult at, le at least, you know, every two days, either say this website to understand how the things are moving on. So this is for, for instance, the shot of yesterday. As you can see in China, we have about 80,000 people of, of cases positive to COVID. In Italy, we have the second place, 70,000 more or less than the US, 54,000. But what is interesting to see is the new deaths. The new deaths in China are only seven because we have a time lag compared to China of three months, let's say. In Italy, it's plus 743, and the US is 202 and 25. This is very important, because if you look at the total death per million people, is only two cases in China. For the moment, is two cases in US, but it's above 100 cases per million in Italy. So this is a very scary picture. So what about the definition? We have two things to be as simple as possible, but avoiding to be simplistic. We have two things to consider, the clinical findings, and according to the WHO, we have to consider the presence of fever about 37.5 plus either cough or shortness of breath. This is just one element for the final attribution or adjudication of the suspected case. Then we need to met also a kind of epidemiological requirements that is the travel or residency in the area of local transmission, direct contact with confirmed or probable case, and need for hospitalization. As you can see, you know, this definition is very generalistic because for all of us that are, you know, hospital workers, 
the need of, for hospitalization is already met. So we can disregard more or less of this, this kind of criteria. The third point is the test. What is important, we will see, you know, <clears throat> carry on my presentation, the importance of the test. And based on these three pillars, we can define the suspected case. That means that you have two symptoms plus one epidemiological findings. Probable case when you have a suspected case with an inconclusive, but also not yet available, but performed test according to the WHO. And finally, the confirmed case are the one that has a positive test regardless of the clinical condition and regardless of the epidemiological findings. What is the definition of contact? So who is the contact? Contact is a person who experienced one of the following. Face-to-face -face contact because of the aerosol with a probable or confirmed COVID case. Direct physical contact. I would like to remind you that three days is the survival of the virus on surfaces. Direct care for a patient. This belongs to you know, our daily job, you know, for, for a patient with a problem or, conf or confirmed COVID-19. Then there are other situations that I will tackle in the next upcoming slides, but we have another things to consider. That is the time windows to adjudicate a contact. So two days before the onset of symptom, up to two weeks later, when you have a symptomatic contact. But in case you face an asymptomatic contact and you make it and you made a test to this contact, you have to calculate two days before the swap, before performing the test, up to two weeks after the test. This is you know the spot, the time spot that you have to consider. So let's move to the readdressing or the definition of WHO that is quite general, okay, to fit it in Italy. You know that Italy now is facing, uh, you know, a, a really bad record that is to be the top of the list in terms of mortality, about 8,000 cases, okay, overall. So as you can see in the north, especially in the north, Lombardy and Veneto and Toscana and Piedmont, what you can see is that there are the largest outbreak spots of the, of the epidemic. So we need to readdress the definition because we need to save lives. So what we did is the following according to the Minister of Health. We don't need to have the combination of two symptoms. We don't need to have fever plus cough. We just need to have at least one symptom. That is fever, for instance, 38, okay, or cough, or shortness of breath, not explained otherwise. And we got rid in the vast majority of the hospital of the epidemiological finding because the local transmission, the community transmission is everywhere. And especially in the hospital, when you stay in the hospital, you can get rid of this kind of criteria. The other things that is important, we implemented a lot the number of tests. This is the only way to succeed, believe me. And it is not, you know, um, it is not, you know, a case that the World Health Organization two days ago delivered a new release of laboratory testing strategy recommendation. That this, you know, the recommendation is to push a lot to make tests <clears throat> for vulnerable patients because of the high rate of mortality and all the healthcare work. This is based on the World Health or, or Organization that actually we started this program at least two weeks ago in Italy because the situation was really dramatic. Giuseppe, can I ask you a question related to this testing, if you don't mind? Uh, yeah. One of the concerns we have here related to testing is that, as you said, uh, sometimes people could be, could be pre-symptomatic. And how often do you test? I'm talking about healthcare workers. So if I don't have symptoms, do you test every day? Uh, how often do you test? Because I may be not exposed today, but I may be exposed tomorrow or the next day. Okay, I'll tell you exactly what has happened. So at the very beginning, we didn't make any tests. But in one week, we got 
six case in different divisions of the cardiovascular de departments. So a lot of a, a lot of infected people, healthcare workers, so it was unacceptable. So at that point, everyone has to be considered a direct contact. So at that point, we did the test every two days for two weeks. This was the policy now. In case of new contacts, we had to restart with the test. And so we have a full use of DPI, but uh, I will uh, go more deeply to this detail in the next upcoming slides, okay? I will, move, uh, I will move on to the next. What about the other situation? I think uh, this is in part, you know, another answer to your question. Sometimes we have situation with a patient with fever plus diarrhea, or we have a viral bust in a specific division like internal medicine, for instance. When we receive a patient to make a catheterization for this kind of patient, where there is, there are, 10 patients infected or a patient from the COVID division, a dedicated COVID division, we will go with the test in all these cases for that patient also, even though these patients are fully asymptomatic. So let's move to the consensus. The Italian Society of Interventional Cardiologists that was delivered online, but now has been submitted to a major, a major US journal and hopefully will be published very soon. Okay, this is the checklist of what we did because we teamed up to try to produce a primer that may give immediate practical suggestion and hopefully effectively measure to reduce the, you know, the infection, the in-hospital, uh, hospital-related infection. So the first thing is the general management of the lab, daily checklist in the lab, daily checklist of crash cart, what to do before the COVID patient arrives in the lab, procedure of toning and doffing, what to do periprocedural, postprocedural requirements. So let's get started with the first two points. This is the list. First of all, in red, identify one room, one dedicated room to treat confirmed or suspected or probable COVID-19 patient. This is my suggestion, especially when you have three rooms, two rooms, four rooms, etc. It's better to save the other room and to dedicate with all the devices, et cetera, one room and all the people need to be trained for that. So you need to have surgical mask, respirator, and N19, A95, FFP2 standard or FFP3, this is for the anesthesiologist. Long sleeves, water resistant gowns, sterile gown, gloves, air covers, high protection, you will see the move in a while, apron, shoe covers due to the risk of space from organic material and chemicals. What about the crash cart? That you have to check every day. Heat and moisture and moisture exchanger filters will be placed on any interface, laryngoscope, mask, circuit, endotracheal tube, supragotyl devices, introducer, closed system, antifogging system, any potential useful drug and blah, blah, you know, these kind of things. So what to do before a COVID-19 patient arrives in the lab and the donning and doffing procedure? Okay, what to do before? Notify the, air, notify the area, receiving the patient, any necessary precautions. You will see in the movie. Maximal coordination to avoid staining, staying in the waiting areas. So we need to spare unnecessary people to stay there health workers, patients, all the people that is not needed to stay there. Get all the patients in the lab away from the path, pre-alert the anesthesiologist to consider elective intubation. Sometimes you have to face patients with a very, you know, intense cough, etc. So you have to intubate the patient. Otherwise the aerosolization is too much, is very risky for all the people that work in a closed room with a neutral or positive ventilation. Because we have to admit that the vast majority of cat lab are not made to isolate the infection because almost you know, none of them 
unless the hybrid room has negative ventilation. Only the personnel involved has to stay in the room, identify a supervisor, they need to make and to dictate the right sequence of the donning and doffing. Then we have to look at the patient. All the patients need to come in with a surgical mask. <clears throat> this is something that you can print and hang on on the wall, but I'll show you the movie that is available for all of you. So this is the way, the path of the COVID patient. As you can see, this is all the way down the corridor. We have the, the room. Then you have other closed room and the way is very clear. And at that, at that point, you need to start with the donning before accepting the patient. Okay, this is very important. Let's see now the video. This is a video that has been done by our department and supported by our society. <clears throat> so first of all, All healthcare workers involved in the procedure must wear the proper PPE before the arrival of the patient. So the first thing is the hand hygiene, as usual. Remove any personal item. Gather the necessary PPE and check on the, on the cart. This is what you need. At this point, you go with the hand hygiene the hardcore. Put on shoe covers. At this point, you need to wear the first gown because at the end, you need two gowns. This is the mask, PP2, FFP2, under me. You need to open it to unwrap. Take off the glasses, and then you put on your face like that. And you pull, you know, the, the strap behind the head. This is the correct manual. Then you need to be sure to dye it up on your face to avoid to have any, you know, risk of aerosolization. Then you go with the cover. This is the time of the face shield. You can go with Google's also. It depends on what you have in your hospital. This is the time of the fair pair of gloves. This is exactly the size that I use, for instance, is seven. For the second gloves, you need to go one size larger. Thank you. 
this time you put on the slide cam. As you can see beside me, there is the supervisor. Uh, tell, tell me the right sequence. Okay, where we have almost concluded Johnny. Last pair of gloves. Final check. The supervisor make a final check to see that everything is okay. You need to take time because the most important thing is to protect, you know, the healthcare workers. Because if you fail in that, you cannot cure the other patients. So this is very important. So let's move on to. Pardon me. Let's skip to. Okay, this is the way, this is, for instance, say COVID patients that arrive in the lab. Giuseppe, while you're doing this, a quick question. This is Mehdi. Um, you, it seems like the other nurses and techs also dressed almost like you. Is yeah. that correct? Because we have a yeah. lot of nurses and technicians that are listening to you. Uh, yeah. I, can you give a couple of comments about that too, please? Yeah, there. They are clearly they are clearly dressed like me, because the point is that you are in case you have a cardiac arrest, you have to think of this, and you need to massage. You stay less than thirty centimeters away from the patient, so you have the same risk of the anesthesiologist. So nobody can you know be undressed in this regard, especially when it is confirmed the COVID. When the COVID is confirmed. You know, you, you cannot risk anything because, you know, the, the infection, the infectivity of the patient is, re, is extremely high. But anyway, this is the way the, the patient get in. I think it's important to look at this detail. They go fast into the room, but at some point, pardon me, there is some problem. Okay. The door has to be immediately closed to avoid any contamination. Okay. Let's move on. Okay, this is my institution, but we've decided also to have a dedicated cabinet that is a COVID. We think that, uh, especially when you do a primary PCI, you need to be very, you know, minimalistic. You don't have to do too many things, only the culprit vessel. We have selected one type of stance with all the sizes in there and some wire that are the workers wire because we don't want to you know touch too many things to avoid avoidable contact that are only you know increase the risk of contamination so what about the doffing when you have finished the procedure especially if you don't have any anti room that is in the vast majority of the lab is like that we don't have any anti room and doffing of the PPE has to be done in the operating room with the door closed. Only the fascia respirator has to be removed outside. Now let's see the doffing movie. This is even more difficult and delicate because you need absolutely to follow all the rules to avoid to contaminate yourself and the team. Thank you. 
So first of all, you have to go with the hand hygiene, with gloves. So what is important is... Giuseppe, one more question. I'm so sorry, I have one more question. What do the nurses and the techs that are transporting the patient doing with their clothes, do you, so they did the case, case is finished. Uh, do they take their clothes off? Do they go yeah, the inside the room, or? inside the room. You will see, you will see the end. You will see the end, but it's inside the room. Okay, the point is that what is important to look at is that the, the gown is tied only outside, not inside. Otherwise it's not possible to take it off, okay, at this stage. <clears throat> What is important when you drop it in a dustbin, you don't have to squeeze because if you squeeze, you increase the risk of aerosolization again. It has been demonstrated. So you just need to drop it. And the gene again. <clears throat> Take off the shield and dispose them safely in a separate containers. Hygiene again. Remove the hair cover. Shoe covers. Question. Yes. Uh, do you do you have separate alcohol bottles? Because it looks like you're using the same bottle. Yeah, no, this is, this is the same, but uh, at the end we eliminate this with all the other things. We use one bottle. By lucky, we have few COVID. STEMI patients. We will discuss this point. But as you can see, this alcohol will be, you know, uh, dropping the dustbin at the end of the procedure. Okay, okay. Oh, thank you. By the cleaners, by the cleaners, not by us. Yes, I used your elbow there. You know, one more question. This is Manus here. How about uh, the beard? They're asking. Yeah, this is a good question. I should have to to shave. This is this is correct. No, but one second, one second, one second. Here, this is important. The final part. You have to go out dressed like that. No one has to touch. Okay, you have to close the room. At this point, you are, you are still wearing the mask. This is very important. At this point, you have to wear another pa a pair of gloves. And this is the way to remove the mask from behind. Like that, closing the eyes, okay, it is possible. And then you remove the, the gown. 
Just a bit, this is Subhash. Before we move forward, can you hear me? Yes. I, I want to yes. ask a question that we have used through this very elegant demonstration of doffing and donning and doffing of, uh, of our uh, equipment and our wearables. Uh, you have used the word COVID positive and COVID suspected. I know you will be going into this detail, but is there any rapid testing that is done before such patients are brought to the cath lab? And if so, how does it impact on the clinical decision making of how to treat a STEMI patient? And what okay. is the timeline of that rapid testing? Because that has implications. I, I hope you will address those questions. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Thank you. This is a very crucial, crucial point. Thank you, Savash, for your points. Uh, what we do now, you have to consider that we have a very high local transmission, community transmission. So the point is that we have a low rate of acute coronary syndrome, especially STEMI patients, it seems that they are vanished. So the point is that what we do is at the first medical attention, for instance, in the emergency department, uh, all the patients with STEMI got a test, an immediate test, they do not make any delay. The test is processed to have an answer in less than 90 minutes. When the patient has been tested, by definition, become a probable COVID patient. When the patient is labeled as probable COVID patient, you wear, in all case, all the PPE and the DPI and the people is ready to do this kind of donning and doffing. While we finish the procedure, we will have the answer of the test that is negative or positive. If it is positive, the patients go to the intensive care that is a dedicated COVID intensive care. It's not the standard CCU. Only if the test is negative, that is extremely unlikely if the patient is asymptomatic. So there are very few false negative, either say none when the patient is symptomatic. Okay, in that case, we are pretty sure that the patient can go to, you know, the standard CCU. So we have a dedicated, you know, division for COVID management that are separated from the standard patients. This is very important. We need to find out the way to try to sort out this, to work out this situation. And this was what we, you know, the strategies that we consider, you know, more safe safer for the health wor healthcare workers, but also they do not make any delay to the cure of the patient, okay? So that, that is the point. Okay, let's move on to the video. So at the end, this is the final part. The drop again is garbage and the final energy. At this point, what is crucial is to take the door closed of the room for one hour. This is the recommendation because you need to have the droplets, you know, lying on the floor. You need to avoid any risk of aerosolization. aerosolization. At that point, you know, the, the cleaner, there is the terminal clean for the room. It takes time. So when you face this is the reason why we have, ded have a dedicated room because you need to take your time. You don't need to rush because there are no hero for these kind of things. There are just people that has to respect the roots for the sake of the health of the other patients and health, health war healthcare workers. Then we have the other two parts that are what we do periprocedurally and post-procedurally. <clears throat> This is what we do periprocedurally. Keep the door closed, this is very important. Avoid entry and exit of the room. I was puzzled by the fact that I've read other consensus that permit to, you know, to get, to have nurses that move in and out in the corridor. This is absolutely not permitted. If you look at the WHO, you need to stay isolated. This is the reason why I would, I would like to have, uh, you know, all the stands at least 
one type of stance, all sizes, everything that I need in that dedicated room. Minimize the contact with the surfaces, keep the procedure as simple as possible, treat in the vast majority of cases only the carpet lesion, dispose all the waste according to protocols. Again, you have to talk with the cleaners to say that there are specific protocols for that. Get out the, open, the operating room, terminal clean at least one hour to allow the errors of the position. <clears throat> Post-procedural requirements, notification of any new confirmed case, a record of all staff providing care. If at any point a member of the staff feels as she or he has been exposed to pathogen, has to follow a specific path, facility protocols that we have in our institution. Staff who have been provided care to confirm <coughs> COVID case should be vigilant what is needed is an active surveillance for fever and respiratory symptoms for at least two weeks following the last exposure to confirmed case and follow all the internal protocols. So let's go to specific case, the STEMI case. Giuseppe, so, can I just ask a quick question here. Um, what, did you, what did you do with your shoes? Because there, there are some others that advocate having dedicated shoes, even Wellington boots that are committed for these COVID cases. How did, how did you manage your shoes and, 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 and getting there? So the point is that, is that when, when we say with the shoe, we take off the covers, we go uh, outside as you've seen. At that point, we have in the way of, 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 the, of the lab, we have a, a zone that has been is that is sterile, okay, with some alcohol, etc. So we leave the, the shoes there and we have another pair of shoes in another place. And so we, we have to try to minimize. That is the, it is the only things that you can do at, at one point, okay? So let's move on to the STEMI cases for the management. So the first consideration is that the STEMI patients are very, are very low. At least in Italy, during you know the 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 outbreak, we've seen in two weeks, I think, one or two cases of staining patients. So you have to consider that you have a low rate, but at the same time, you have a very high infect, infecting risk for the other patients and the healthcare workers. So all the patients has to be considered because. They're gonna get a test suspected or confirmed. We activate the COVID protocol. So there is an expected delay because we have to prepare all the things. This is the reason why we consider lytic, <clears throat> lytic uh, agents as the first choice when we have stable patient with an expected extra delay in, compared to an immediate lytic of at least an hour. Time from symptom onset is less than six hours and the hospital is not equipped to manage COVID-19 because sometimes we have also spoke hospital or other things like that. So, uh, Giuseppe, Giuseppe, I want to uh, interject here. Uh, this is a critical point you make. Uh, COVID-19 equipped to manage hospitals. So are in your city and local regions such hospitals designated where there are, there are special provisions of handling patients who have been tested positive. I'll can tell you, you more. I'll elaborate tell you, on this point. I'll tell you more. There have been hospitals that has been closed. That has been closed to avoid, because there were at the very early beginning of our experience, your point again, Sabash, is really on, is, is perfect. Because when we started with our experience, you know, the first things that we observed is that in the Spock Hospital, we had some, you know, uh, kind of burst of infections. At that point, the hospital were closed and all the people were sent in quarantine because there were too many cases in a day. So at that point, there are some hospitals that are closed, but now we have, for instance, Padua University is a spoke hospital, and this spoke not only for STEMI, it's spoke for STEMI and for the risk of having and hosting COVID patients. So the answer is yes, we have a dedicated hospital for that. That are, you know, the larger one. So you are the hub of, the, of that arrangement. 
And the yeah. second question is that your statement about fibrinolysis as the first choice, is it also because of the fact that you have time delay of some kind or limited time delay for performing the rapid COVID test in the emergency room or during presentation? Yeah. Well, Can you there, elaborate on that point? There are two things that are simultaneous, as I told you. There is a non-infective risk. If you have a patient with two hours from symptom onset, that, that is almost the golden, the two golden hour, we can say, okay, the lytic is particularly effective, the patient is stable, the, you don't have a risk of intracranial hemorrhage, and you have for sure an extra delay, for sure an extra delay, because you, you go with a test, then all the people is wearing DPI. You need to follow particular attention because we have a shield sometimes. When we have a patient, for instance, that has a STEMI and it is a clear COVID patient, the patient is covered with a, a, a shield, all the patients. So it takes time. So for sure you have an extra delay. So these two considerations, at the end, make us considering that uh, fibrinolysis is, is, might be the first choice in these specific categories of patients. But obviously, if you have a 50 year old patient in pre-shock uh, with eight hours from symptom onset, it's uh, even though you have an extra delay of 65 or 70 minutes, it is clear that the way is for primary PCI. Giuseppe, completely understand. That is a general direction you're providing, but I understand your point that each clinical situations may be uh, assessed based on the merits of that situation. So I completely understand the personalized approach, but uh, also uh, very clear. So please proceed. Thank you for clarifying. So the, point, the only thing is, Savage, you have to be, you might use also, you know, some case by case approach for the patients, but you cannot use a case by case approach in terms of protection of the system. So this might be the main takeaways, okay? Excellent. Excellent point. Um, okay, let's go to the end of my presentation. Let's try to connect the dots. As I told you at the very early beginning of my presentation, Laura, here is where we are. So Veneto is more or less where we are because we took experience from Lombardia, where the outbreak anticipated our outbreak of at least two weeks. Okay, two weeks. It seems a really short time, but it's a very long time. So in two weeks, you can face and witness a, really a deadly disaster. You know, and, and look at this. Okay, in Lombardia, for instance, we have a total COVID patients. This has been upda uh, updated on 24th of March, 30,000 cases against 6,000 cases in Veneto. Mortality rate, number of deaths compared to overall population, okay? 0.04% and 10 times less in Benedo, 0.004%. What about the lethality rate? Number of, of deaths versus the number of the patients that were tested for, for COVID and resulted to be positive. So the mortality in Lombardia is 14%. We are not talking about, you know, um, not developed countries. We are talking about the top of the list sanitary system of Italy, Lombardia, 14%. You know that there is San Rafael and many other people there. 14%. In Veneto is 3.6%. Why that? It is surprising to me that there are some microbiologists, infectivologists that said they are saying that this is matter of a mutation of the virus. This is not true. This is simply related to the fact that in Lombardia they started making the test to the patients that, that were severely symptomatic. Severely symptomatic. If you make the test that patients are severely symptomatic, it is clear that the percentage of patients that will die because of the coronavirus are high. The point is that, that you need to make the test in a patient for sure symptomatic, even mildly symptomatic. And in the hospital, you need to have specific protocol also for the asymptomatic people, as according to the last release of the WHO that says that all the healthcare providers need to be tested. 
to be sure at some point that you don't have enough a, a burst of infection within your division. But Giuseppe, anyway, Giuseppe, you make a very very critical point. I hate to exercise my uh, my uh, privilege as a moderator to ask this point again. And Dr. Shishabor, my friend Mehdi, asked this of you earlier. So you make the point that this lower lethality rate ha is somehow has to do with the frequency of testing of both asymptomatic patients and symptomatic patients, and of course, more frequent testing of healthcare providers. So can you please elaborate without, we are not going to be judgmental here and compare, and compare but can you elaborate that are you testing symptomatic and asymptomatic patients who are probable at risk daily in the hospital? Let yeah. me finish my question. Are these tests available to the public? And are healthcare providers being tested daily? Those are three separate questions. If you can answer them, I think it'll help a lot of us understand how you're dealing with this. So actually what we have learned and what in the system now is the following. In cardiology setting, okay, because I work there, we don't admit elective patients. We have suspended all the admission of elective patients, not urgent or emergent or high-risk patients. So <clears throat> we do not call low-risk elective patients. All the patients that are elective in our department, we receive a test that is not a fast test. The patients are called to make a test, for instance, 10 patients per day. They are called two days before the admission to make the test even though they are asymptomatic. Because we don't want to have the risk to include in our division asymptomatic carriers, considering where we are, considering the, the fact that we live in a gathering bank. No one is on the street. All the activities are closed. It's like living in God cities. So we have to, to have a kind of DEFCON 2 recommendation that means before getting in the hospital we don't want to threat your health and we don't want to threat the other patients that are frail in cardiology so we make the test two days ago we have few patients 10, 10 patients per day in cardiology for instance two days before the admission at that point before getting admitted again that we receive the measurement of the fever and they receive a test to a questionnaire to say if everything is correct immediately before the admission. Only with all this, you will be admitted in the hospital as elective case. For the um, emergency department, they'll do the test for all the patients admitted with uh, in the in the emergency department. But this is a kind of you know dramatic measure because we live a dramatic situation. So we started with only with symptomatic case, but in Veneto, what we got is that we make an epidemiological survey in a city, a small city, that is named Vo, that's witnessed a, a huge outbreak. And they found making to all the patients, the test, the 3% of the patients were on the street and were asymptomatic carriers, 3% out of 20,000 people is an enormous number, okay? So what we got is that if you wanna stop all the things that means the community infectivity and contagious, we had to apply a very strict gathering ban. And this is the most important thing. The other way is to eliminate the hospital-related transmission. And making more tests is very important. At least, for instance, in US, I think you have to start for, to check out for the patient that has fever, cough, or other symptoms. You don't need to wait to have two or three symptoms. If the patient has 39 of fever, even though the patient do not, you know, says that he has dyspnea, it's better to go before, you know, put the patient in a room with other four patients or in CCU and to create a disaster, it's better to have a test. You have two different tests 
the very quick test that you will get the answer in less than 90 minutes. And you have another test that takes between three hours and six hours. But sometimes in my hospital, a few days ago, the hospital has done 5,500 tests per day. So uh, doing- The point is well taken, thank you. That, that, no, 5,500 uh, tests per day. At this point, we have to wait two days sometimes because there are too many things to do. But anyway, thank you. So what, what about the connecting the dot, the difference between Lombardia and Veneto? Earlier outbreak, so Lombardia was not prepared because you learn, you know, uh, on the way. You have some patients, then you will see that there are much more patients, then you have some healthcare workers infected. At that point, you need to understand that you need to apply strict rules. Then they delay the isolation measurement. This is very important. So the distancing measures are almost everything for this kind of infection. The, the point that they make too low number of tests, also in, in mildly symptomatic patients. It's important if you wanna preserve and prevent the diffusion of this outbreak, especially in the hospital, and less active surveillance. All these reasons are important to keep in mind. And we don't have to invent anything because I try to look up for the number of tests, as you can see in Lombardia, even though they look at the lethality rate, it was related to the fact that the number of tests were half the one that we made in Veneto. And this is, uh, this is important. This is important. And uh, if you look up to WikiHow, there is something and you type how to do, to avoid to make something wrong in, in impending pandemia, you will have some points. I will have just, you know, highlighted two points. The two major mistakes are to not protect the healthcare workforce by no system testing, especially, you know, with the rules that we said before, and not to have mask, shield, and PPE for healthcare workforce. So two things in the hospital, more testing, Okay, and the second one is to have DPI and to take times to have protocol, to have simulation, to train the people to face in not like a hero, but like a smart people that says we have to continue doing our work, we have to protect our family, and we have to continue to cure the other patients. So this is my last slide just to say, my dear friends, hang in there. This is on behalf of all the healthcare workers in Italy, all the volunteers, the people that are struggling and working every day to try to break and to overtake this very deadly, this very deadly disease and plague. But I'm pretty sure that if we work all together, we share knowledge like in this webinar. So I'm particularly, you know, <clears throat> I feel the privilege to participate to this and we have to work as a one if you want to really take over and to see, you know, a new bright future for all together and to look for a very fast, you know, uh, no, a very, a very, you know, large sa life saving uh, opportunities for all the patient. Thank you for your Thank you so much, uh, Giuseppe. You know, we really appreciate you. And uh, I wanted to push a little bit and ask you one more time this question, because I know that many of my own nurses and techs are watching this. Um, and the question is that once you ha have a patient that is COVID positive or a very high susceptibility for COVID in the cat lab, and you have now finished the case, those nurses in the room that have gowns and masks, should they be transporting that patient with the same gowns and masks to this ICU or to the floor, or should they change? Honestly, I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm honestly having watched oh, this. So this is a very, very important question. So what happens is the following. According to the fact that the patient is COVID positive or not by the test, if the patient COVID positive, 
the patient will go to intensive care unit that is a dedicated COVID one. So they come taking the patients with all the protection and all the people in the room stay there. There is another team that comes to the room to pick the patients and bring the patient in the other division. Because these people has to stay there to reduce and to minimize the risk of contamination uh, you know, of, the, of the rest of the lab. So they stay there, they follow the rules, all the people stay in the room with the mask and they come out with the mask uh, uh, still on. And then at that point, uh, they use and follow the last part of the Dolphin movie. That's wonderful. One more question I ask, I'm sure uh, my, my co-moderators have many questions. Uh, one of the questions that just came to my phone by text, uh, do you do anything special with your lead? Do you have any rules you about cleaning the lead? your lead apron. Yeah, yeah, um, uh, related to the lead, this is important because uh, there is, again, you have to talk with the, with the cleaners, okay? Because you need to have a program for that. So they come also with the DPI, again, and they clean first the room, and then there is another part that clean all these lead coats, etc. It, you have a dedicated protocol also for that. It is it is a good question, please. Honest. You don't have you don't have to invent anything. If you try to invent something, it is for sure a mistake. So Giuseppe, that's that was phenomenal. Thank you so much. And hang in there as well. I know Italy is being tested very heavily right now. One quick question that um, that came up regarding our practice here. You know, here we don't have a rapid testing. It takes two or three days. Therefore, for pretty much everyone is um, considered probable or high if there is any concern going in through the emergency room. So do you suggest we do the same process that you just described for pretty much everyone that's probable? Is that right? Yeah, is it right? Because considering that when you talk with your administrative people, you have to... Uh, to reassure them that the number of STEMI patients are very low. What is more important uh, is to preserve all the other workers uh, for the other cases. So when you have a STEMI patient, you don't have a test, you have to make the swab to the patient. And when you make the swab for this kind of patient, you need to protect all the team and to say that they have to, to wear the DPI. That's the point. In case you don't have an answer, it's better to protect yourself. I'll tell you one thing. One, something in the middle might be that you want to wear the DPI when you have a patient with fever plus stemming. Okay, this might be, you know, a measure, but you're not sure because you have the asymptomatic care that are 3%, as I told you, and the rate of contamination of the asymptomatic care is as high as the symptomatic patients. So if you want to be 100% certain that you are protecting the systems, you have to consider the emergency situation like also a probable COVID patient. Giuseppe, thank you for that answer. I'm going to ask you two quick questions. The first question is prefaced by the disclosure that neither I, uh, none of the panelists, hopefully, or you are ID infectious disease specialists, but this is a question for you. Is, are you aware, uh, probably the right way to frame it, are you aware at your hospital uh, there is use of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin combination? This is a question that has been forwarded to me, so I'm asking on behalf of the audience. Uh, can you comment on that? Or if you do not know, uh, I completely understand. What, 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 what you are talking about, about uh, hygiene of the surface or what? No, no, no. Use of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin combination uh, for potential uh, patients. One second, because I had it. That's one question. And second, while you uh, search that information, I just want to say that you made a very important point that there has been an evolution of practice uh, from in different parts of Italy, places that have been in that, the epicenter and those that are away and that have learned from it, a similar evolution is happening here. I think there is greater and increasing amount of coordination 
between governmental and non-governmental agencies. And, and I think there's a, a very serious mobilization going on at all medical centers in the US. So uh, your presentation would add to that knowledge base. And I profusely thank you for taking this very valuable time. Okay, your... related to the, yeah. to the first point, uh, our center has been selected by the Minister of Health to run a randomized trial on these new drugs. We have more or less 10 trials ongoing and uh, we have just started. So I think it takes some months to complete them. But the answer question, is yes. Another question, are you measuring in addition to uh, cardiac biomarkers or myonecrosis, other biomarkers in stratifying or risk stratifying patients? Because we have heard about effect of lungs and myocarditis and other kinds of uh, conditions that could be affecting. Are you using any biomarker that. surveillance of these patients? I know, I know that. This is another good point because I participated to other meeting, etc. And there is this kind of, uh, you know, warning about myocarditis, other things. I'll tell you one thing. About the myocarditis, we have had during the flu, okay, we had more or less three to four patients every two weeks with severe heart failure, we need for urgent transplantation. In all cases, these patients were flu patients. No one, no one was coronavirus patients. So the point to me now is to pay attention to what is really important. What is really important to avoid the infection. The second point is that the coronavirus take first the lung. If you are unlucky and it's not sufficient, the positive pressure mask or shield or other things, and you get intubated, in our experience, when you get intubated too late, the mortality in our experience is 90%, 90%. And it belongs mostly to the patients that are older with a lot of comorbidities, etc. So please focus on what comes first. What comes first is the protection. The second thing is the um, lung intensive care. You won't see any overload in cardiology divisions because you have a dropout in the patient that need to, to be treated for other things. I'll tell you once, this is my last comment that I would like, I would like to share to you. Many people say that the patients with acute coronary syndrome don't want to go to the hospital because they are feared by the fact that you might, they might be contagious with or infected with the COVID. This is not true because when the patient has an acute myocardial infection, it's very difficult with the chest pain, etc., to not call you know the the 911 in US or other services to go, to join to go to the hospital. The point is that that now we have two different predators. That is the acute coronary syndrome, and the other one is Mr. COVID, that has the same prey with the same identity. It is all the patient with multiple comorbidities, etc. So when you have a pandemia, when you have an outbreak of infection disease, you know, we, what we have learned also from other countries, India or other points, it's difficult to see that the acute coronary syndrome will overtake the infection rate of this disease. So this point is a competing risk, it's very simple. So these are my main takeaways. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. Uh, I think uh, we, are, we have a lot of questions coming through the chat line. I would like uh, my co-moderators, if they have any other questions to ask, if uh, there's one question uh, that is just popped up on my screen. It says, in our hospital, our coronavirus until is one flow un uh, floor underneath the cath lab. We cannot transport an intubated patient from that floor to the cath lab floor without using an ambu bag for ventilation. Do you think it is wise or this can be considered a break of circuit? This is a very specific question, but in general, Marsh, I think transportation this is, uh, is important. This so kind of, how Marsh, do you transport a ventilated say, patient? So Marsh, I was just going to say these kind of specific questions yeah. are a little bit outside of the scope, uh, especially Giuseppe is very knowledgeable, obviously, but he's not even in this country. So yeah. I think that Good. maybe uh, we leave uh, the specific oh. questions to... Uh, the experts in the local hospitals and answer more global things. Uh, maybe in regards to ambu bagging, you can comment. 
Correct. You know, do you think that puts us more exposure? I'm thinking it would, but I don't even know, to be honest. With you. <coughs> but I don't think we should get a specific because beyond the scope of our of our presentation, if you agree. Good, good point. I agree. I agree. Good point. Manas, do you have any, any uh, parting comments? I have one last question. I have one last question, Jujeb, again. Go ahead. You said six people in your department. Actually, you bring people sooner in. How do you deal with healthcare workers being infected and then needing to be out and you're out of staff to do catheterizations or any procedures? When they are COVID positive, they go in quarantine for two weeks. And before getting readmitted to the hospital, they need to do two negative tests 48 hours apart and they, are, and they have to be fully without any symptoms. This is the rule, the, the protocol that we have. So two weeks completely free of symptoms and two tests negative one from the other part of 48 hours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Giuseppe, this has been an extraordinary session with you. Uh, again, I reiterate uh, your key point is uh, that, uh, uh, that, that where you guys started in Italy and where you are today has been an evolution. And I'm hoping that as you continue to learn uh, through your processes, we'll, be have, we'll have the opportunity to get you back and, and be enlightened by you with some very, very uh, exciting presentations, and if you if your protocols change or there is any update, we hope to get get you back to our forum. So I I would like to thank all my co-panelists from Cardiovascular Innovations, uh, Kelly Desaitnik, and all the participants who have contributed to it, and above all to you and your colleagues. Who I'm sure behind you are a number of key, very talented, young, and dynamic people who yeah. have helped to prepare this. Uh, our best wishes are for the entire nation of Italy and of course with your hospital and, and personally for your family. Stay safe and, and work hard and we look forward to having you back on a CBI webcast again in the near future. Thank you again and signing off Thank from CBI. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Everyone. Thank you.